Hi students and welcome to your next lecture in recombinant DNA technology. In this lecture we will touch on some concepts in the second and the fourth learning objectives. So in this lecture I'm going to explain the concept of restriction mapping. Restriction mapping involves using restriction enzymes to identify the position of these restriction sites on a fragment of DNA where we don't know any information about the sequence of DNA on that fragment. So before we continue with the actual process of restriction mapping and how it's done, I'd like for you to consider two scenarios. And this is the genome or the source of DNA that we're looking at in our restriction mapping study. On the left, we have a circular plasmid, which is 3000 base pairs. And on the right, we have a linear DNA strand. Now let's consider that we are cutting both the plasmid and the linear DNA strand with one restriction enzyme that has just a single restriction site in each of these cases. So the plasmid or the linear DNA strand has only one restriction site for the restriction enzyme that we're looking at. Now, in the case of the plasmid, we're cleaving this plasmid with one restriction enzyme at one position in the circular genome. If we were to run this product on an agarose gel, what we would see is just one linear fragment, which is the length of the plasmid, which is 3000 base pairs. So if we were to draw an analogy to a rubber band, now even though this is a double-stranded DNA fragment, we're just using one line to represent the double-stranded DNA fragment. So we are cleaving this fragment with one restriction enzyme, which is analogous to cutting a rubber band with a scissor in just one position. So if we cleave this fragment with one restriction enzyme, we do something called linearizing the fragment. And we call this linearizing the fragment because now the fragment is no longer circular. It's linear because we have cut that. Just as if you were to take a scissor and cut a rubber band, you end up with just one long strand now that's not joined. In the same way, when you restrict a circular DNA fragment with one restriction enzyme, you end up with one linear fragment. But if the source of our DNA is already linear, we have a linear strand of DNA, we cut it with one restriction enzyme, we are now cutting that linear fragment into two pieces. So you have now a 200 and an 800 base pair strand if that restriction enzyme were to cleave 200 base pairs from the left side of the sequence. Now let's consider if we were cleaving both of these with two restriction enzymes. So we're cutting them with two restriction enzymes at the same time. In the case of the plasmid, if you cleaved a circular piece of DNA with two restriction enzymes, you end up with two linear fragments. So say in this case we end up with a 1200 and an 1800 base pair fragment because these two add up to 3000 base pairs. We have two linear fragments when we cut with two restriction enzymes for a circular strand of DNA. But if we were to cleave a linear DNA strand with two restriction enzymes, you would end up with three fragments. In this case, a 200, 150, and a 650 base pair fragment. So when you are cutting a circular plasmid with one restriction enzyme, you have one product. With two, you have two products. Whereas if you are cleaving a linear DNA strand with one restriction enzyme, you have two products. And if you cleave a linear strand with two restriction enzymes, you have three fragments. So think of that whenever we are looking at restriction mapping studies. I'd now like to go on with explaining restriction mapping. And I'm going to talk about mapping the position of restriction enzymes in a linear fragment of DNA because this is easier to understand. We'll then move on to how this is done with a circular DNA fragment. In this scenario, we have a 1,200 base pair fragment of DNA, which is linear. We're now going to expose this linear DNA fragment to the HINT3 restriction enzyme. 
and we're going to run those products on an agarose gel. So when we cleave this 1200 base pair fragment with hint 3, we end up with two fragments on the agarose gel. And here's our little agarose gel. We've got the uncut fragment, which is 1200 base pairs. And we've got hint 3 with an 800 and a 400 base pair fragment. So here it is. So when we've cleaved this 1200 base pair fragment, we end up with two fragments on the agarose gel an 800 and a 400 base pair fragment. So this tells us that hint 3 cuts this 1200 base pair fragment somewhere along the sequence and gives us a 400 and an 800 base pair product. So we don't know if this hint 3 site is located from the left or from the right, but uh, we can determine where restriction enzymes are in relation to each other. This is done by using combinations of restriction enzymes. So let's say we were to restrict the same linear fragment now with another restriction enzyme, BAMH1. When we cleave this linear fragment with BAMH1 and we run these products on an agarose gel, we end up with a 300 and a 900 base pair fragment. And here they are on the gel. You see the 900 base pair fragment, which is located between the 1000 and 800 base pair bands on the marker. And here's the 300 base pair fragment in line with the 300 base pair strand on the marker. So now we know we get two fragments with HIN3 and two fragments with BAMH1 when we restrict this linear fragment individually. But this doesn't tell us where these restriction sites are positioned on this 1200 base pair fragment. So if we were to consider these restriction sites, BAMH1, the restriction site, could either be located here from the left or it could be located on this side from the right. In both cases, we would end up with a 300 and a 900 base pair fragment. So how can we tell whether the BAMH1 site was located somewhere here or was it located somewhere here? So in a double digestion, what we will do is treat the linear fragment with both restriction enzymes at the same time. So we expose this uncut fragment to both HINT3 and BAMH1 at the same time. And then we look at the products on an agarose gel. So let's look at what we get. So we've restricted the product with HINT3 and BAMH1. And now we see we end up with an 800 base pair fragment, a 300 base pair fragment, and a 100 base pair fragment. So now, if we look at these three fragments, we've got a 300, 100, and an 800 base pair fragment. This tells us that that 800 base pair fragment cleaved by HINT3 was unaffected, which means that the BAMH1 restriction site does not affect that 800 base pair fragment. But if we consider the HIN3-400 base pair fragment, during the double digestion, the 400 base pair fragment is no longer there. Instead, we have a 300 and a 100 base pair fragment. And that tells us that the HIN3-400 base pair fragment contains the BAMH1 restriction site. So here we have the position of HIN3, there it is over there. And there we have BAMH1. And that BAMH1 restriction site is now located within the HINT3-400 base pair fragment. So this tells us the position of the BAMH1 and the HINT3 restriction sites in relation to each other. And in this way, we can do this with various combinations of restriction enzymes. So we could use another restriction enzyme and then di digest it with... Um, HINT3 and say another restriction enzyme, identify the position of that re restriction enzyme in relation to HINT3 and in relation to BAMH1. And using these various combinations of restriction enzymes, we can then draw a map. And this will tell us the position of each restriction site within this linear fragment. So let's move on now to mapping a circular genome. And say, for example, we have a plasmid 
and the sequence of this plasmid, the DNA sequence of this plasmid, is unknown. So we don't know anything about the sequence. We can then use different restriction enzymes and test this out and look at what happens to this plasmid under different conditions. Now, in this scenario, we're looking at restriction enzymes that cleave this plasmid in just one location. So you're just going to get one, one product when you linearize this, this plasmid. So if we restrict with BAMH1, for example, we end up with one linearized plasmid. Now you've got a linear fragment, which can then be used in double digestion studies. So say, for example, we do a double digestion with BAMH1 and KPN1, and then we run these products on a gel. We now end up with a 1000 and a 2000 base pair fragment. And this will tell us that the KPN1 restriction site and the BAMH1 restriction sites are 1,000 base pairs away from each other. However, we can't tell whether KPN1 is located on this side or on that side. We can then do a triple digest or combine three different restriction enzymes in one reaction. Alternatively, we can also cleave the circular DNA fragment with BAMH1 only. And then we can do a double digestion with KPN1 and PST1. And so in that way, we can use that linear fragment with one restriction enzymes, and we can extract that linear fragment, and we can perform double digestions on that fragment or triple digestions on that fragment. And using the same principle that we explained above with restriction mapping, we can then identify the location of each of these restriction sites in relation to each other on the DNA strand. So in this case, we have done a double digest with BAMH1 and KPN1, or we have taken that BAMH1 digested fragment and digested it then with KPN and PST1. And we find then that we have a 1,800 and a 1,200 base pair fragment, which means the 2,000 base pair fragment was cleaved by PST1, which means that the PST1 restriction site is located somewhere in this 2000 base pair fragment. Then we can include a, an additional restriction enzyme, NOT1, and then we can look at where NOT1 cleaves the fragment. And we see when we restrict with NOT1, the 1000 and the 800 base pair fragments are unaffected, but the 1200 base pair fragment was cleaved into 900 and 300 base pairs which tells us that the NOT1 restriction site is located in the fragment between PST1 and BAMH1. And as we do multiple combinations of restriction enzymes, we can then identify the position of each of these restriction sites in relation to each other. And this gives us some idea of the position of these restriction enzymes within the genome and we'll be able to map the genome in this way. So we'll be able to then say that, okay, there's a BAMH1 restriction site located here, or there's a KPN1 restriction site located here, and that will tell us where these restriction sites are in relation to each other. And this will allow us to compose some kind of idea of the sequence of this plasmid. So restriction mapping is used to identify the position of restriction sites in a DNA fragment in relation to each other. It gives an idea of the genome sequence, and it's used to map genomes when we have no information on that sequence. So we have no idea what the sequence is or anything in that sequence, and we can therefore use restriction enzymes to map this genome. Um, restriction enzymes are also used to introduce primers. So say, for example, we were to cleave this plasmid with BAMH1. We found that it linearized the fragment. We can then introduce our own DNA sequence here that is known, and then we can use that for sequencing. So this summarizes how restriction mapping was done. Remember that restriction mapping is a technique that was used before DNA sequencing came about. And so this was very useful to map genomes before any modern day technology was available.
So this concludes the lecture on restriction mapping, and it introduces the concepts that we need to understand for molecular cloning. So whilst restriction mapping is not as commonly used today because of DNA sequencing, we still use restriction enzymes in molecular cloning, and we may use restriction enzymes to cut a circular DNA fragment so that we can ligate additional fragments of DNA into that circular fragment. And we'll cover these concepts when we discuss molecular cloning next week. Thank you.